Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to do the very final video kind of wrapping up my 2022 reading year. So today's video is going to be talking about my honorable mentions or books that didn't quite make my all-time favorites of 2022 but I still think about these books quite frequently because they were such a solid and enjoyable reading experience and if I'm being honest with you a lot of these I actually think about more than most of the books that made my top list. There was just something about these books that really worked for me but weren't quite to the level of favorites for the year overall and if you've been around my channel for the past few months some of these are definitely going to be ones that you've heard me talk about quite frequently but others I haven't talked about at all or if I have it's been very minimal so I did want to go ahead and touch upon these books and share them with you because I do really really enjoy them they were solid reading experiences for me and I do recommend them so let's go ahead and jump in so the one and only romance that is making this list is going to be Archer's Voice by Mia Sheridan this was my very first experience with Mia Sheridan and it absolutely will not be my last so this follows our main character Brie Prescott and at the beginning of the story she is kind of randomly up and moved to this very small town in Maine she is running away from something in her past she's just seeking a little bit of peace and so she ends up in this small main town and on her very first day there she meets Archer Hale he is a young man roughly around her age but he is looking really rough very scraggly you know longer haired kind of looks homeless and this really intrigues Brie and so she starts to dig into a little bit more about who he is and one day if I remember correctly I believe she is passing by his house with her dog and her dog kind of darts into his backyard and so she has to go after her dog and then that's when she and Archer officially start building a friendship and then a relationship you learn a lot about Archer and the trauma in his past, a trauma that was so great that it actually caused him to stop speaking. So he hasn't said a word since this trauma. And because Brie actually knows sign language, she's able to communicate with him through sign language and through lip reading and things like that. Because Archer can actually hear her, he is just not able to speak to her. So when I read the synopsis of this, this book sounded like it could easily be one of my favorite romances of all time. It had a lot of things that I really look for in romances. It sounded very slow burn, very angsty, you know, and then you have this damaged boy who just needs the right woman to show him that he is worthy of love. And for the first 150 pages of this book I was in I was sold I was loving it so very much this book had something that I very much really enjoy and appreciate in romance books and that's the very non-sexual intimate moments kind of like if you've read House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Mass that shower scene between Bryce and Hunt had nothing to do with sex but it was probably one of the most intimate scenes I've ever read in my life there was a similar situation in here where Bree is actually giving Archer a haircut for the first time in who knows how long and it was just very very intimate without being related to sex or anything like that so so I love those moments in romance books and I feel like this did that very well. However, the latter half of this book started to lose me and that's why this didn't actually make it into my all-time favorites of 2022 even though it had a strong possibility of being in that list and here's why. This book is almost 400 pages. I believe it's 380 pages but yet by the halfway mark or even before the halfway mark, Bree and Archer are already starting to develop a romantic relationship and share their feelings towards each other. Now keep in mind that Archer Hale is a very traumatized person. He hasn't really developed any relationship with anybody since this trauma. He's been very very reclusive, very standoffish. Most people in the town don't really know a whole lot about him. A lot of people kind of view him warily. They might even be a little bit scared of him. There are a lot of rumors that go around about him. But then all of a sudden by the halfway mark, he's already opening up and letting Brie in and they are developing this romantic relationship. And so what does that mean for this story? That means that for the latter half of this story, Mia Sheridan has to introduce a lot of conflict in order to keep the story going. And so what ends up happening is that this is Archer and Brie falling apart just to come back together again, over and over. And there are some things in here that happen, unnecessary drama that didn't really need to be in here. And there was actually even one point where something happened that bothered Archer so much that he had to just kind of up and leave the town. He had to kind of go on this journey of self-discovery, if you will. And he just abandons Brie, basically. He uh, he ups and leaves. And then he comes back and, you know, kind of ends and goes from there with their happily ever after. I don't think that's a spoiler. I think you kind of know what you're getting with a book like this. So I personally feel like this book could have been a lot shorter. I feel like this could have been about 300 pages and it could have had just the same effect. And it also could have been structured differently. I feel like it definitely needed to be structured differently if it was going to remain main 380 pages. Brie needed to come to town. She and Archer over several weeks and months even needed to develop this very strong trusting friendship before it moved into a tentative relationship and started to go from there. And then all of a sudden this dramatic conflict arises where Archer ups and leaves town and then he comes back. But instead of Brie welcoming him with open arms, she's a little bit more trepidatious. You know, she's like, hey, you left me. I'm not just gonna come back to you. And then they start working their way back to each other. I feel like if it had been structured that way, this would have been 100% perfect for me. It would have had the slow burn. It would have had the 
angst on the front end then it also would have had a little bit of that on the back end too but just the way that this was structured along with the length of it it didn't quite work for me so do I still feel like this was a solid romance yes I absolutely loved Brie and Archer together I loved just Archer as a character overall and I loved how Brie basically became his voice and she helped him find his own voice like not necessarily in terms of him talking but him finding his place in the town and him not being afraid to be out in the world and so I loved all of those dynamics I just feel like some of the execution of this was a little bit lost on me but still overall like I said it was a very solid four star read it's definitely one of my favorite romances that I read in 2022 I still highly recommend and like I said this will not be my last experience with Mia Sheridan I have more books of hers on my TBR and I'm excited to get to them next I want to go ahead and talk about Firstborn by Will D so this little gem snuck in and kind of restored my faith in the thriller suspense genre prior to reading this book I had read a bunch of just very mediocre thrillers I was kind of in a slump with regard to them I thought that I was going to need to take a long-term break from reading thrillers because everything about the genre was disappointing me until I got to this book which was extremely surprising because first of all I had never heard of Will Dean before he was not an author I knew existed and all of a sudden this book came up as a book of the month selection and on a leap of faith I went ahead and selected it and I enjoyed it so much more than I thought I would and I don't really want to say a lot about this story I'll just give you a very basic premise of it so this story is following two twin sisters and they're not necessarily estranged but they're definitely not as close as they once were and the two are extremely different one of them was very outgoing very gregarious very vivacious very adventurous and she actually leaves London to study abroad in New York leaving behind her other sister who like I said is very different from her she is very introverted she's very anxious and she's very fear driven like she takes all kinds of precautions in order to keep herself safe because she just thinks that death is lurking around absolutely every single corner then the twin that's in New York gets brutally murdered and the twin that was left behind in London is determined to figure out what happened to her sister and it goes from there she goes to New York with her parents and she's trying to solve what happened to her sister y'all there were two main twists in this story and both of them got me now y'all know that I've been reading mystery suspense thrillers for my entire life and it takes a lot to actually surprise me and a lot of times I can predict the twist I can see what's coming but not this for some reason so the first one came and I was like oh and then the second one came and I was like oh damn like both of them really got me and that's why this ended up in this honorable mentions list because it has been a long time since the book shocked me like that and something that was so out of left field because like I said this was an unknown author to me I had no idea who he was what he was capable of and I just randomly picked this up on a whim from book of the month and it ended up blowing me out of the water and so that is why I absolutely wanted to mention that here in this video in case you have never read a Will Dean I would highly recommend this one because this was a gem and I'm excited to read more from him in the future kind of along similar lines I have the collective by Allison Galen this was another one from book of the month by an author I had never heard of before although she does actually have an extensive backlist that I'm excited to get to but I had never heard of her and this one ended up being such a compulsively readable story that I had to mention it here because I do still think of it not because just of the content of a lot of the story but the actual ending too the ending got me as well so this follows our main character Camille and five years prior to the start of the story she tragically lost her daughter and she is still very much in her grief you know she still gets up and functions every day but she's still very much in the throes of grief and it's worse because she doesn't believe her daughter's death was an accident like everybody else seems to think she actually believes that there's a privileged young man that's responsible for her daughter's death and nothing was ever done to find justice for her daughter and then one day there is an event happening that's actually honoring this young man and so Camille shows up and she basically loses her cool and this is all caught on tape it basically goes viral she's this crazy grieving lady that goes after this wonderful young man basically and it's this video that catches the attention of the collective who are a bunch of women just like Camille they've all lost somebody unjustly and so they take it upon themselves to serve that justice to the people they believe deserve it and the way that they do this is so clever it is so creative it's so intricate literally every single detail is plotted out and it was fantastic I just loved watching it unfold watching Camille find herself get wrapped up in something get herself very much over her head she realizes what they are doing and she's trepidatious about it but she goes along with it because she believes that these people truly deserve justice and she wants to get justice for her daughter and so it progresses from there as she gets more and more wrapped up in the collective and then she starts to find her conscience and what happens when she does so I don't really want to say much more than that I feel like this is a story that you can go in kind of blind and just enjoy the ride because it was it was a dark and twisty ride I was there for every single second of it and I tore through this book I think it took me less than two days to just fly through this book while I was doing like mindless tasks I actually would find things for me to do so that I could listen to the story because I just wanted to find out what happened and then like I said the ending really got me I wasn't really expecting it to head in that direction and Allison Galen took it there and so that's another reason why this made it on this list just because this was another book that really took a turn that I wasn't expecting and I always appreciate that in a suspense thriller so that is why this made my honorable mentions list next I have Big Lies in a Small Town by Diane Chamberlain Diane Chamberlain is quickly becoming one of my favorite historical 
nonfiction authors, especially after my reading experience with this book because it was so strong and I enjoyed it immensely. So this story is told in two timelines. The present day timeline in this is 2018 and it follows our main character Morgan Christopher. At the start of the story she's actually in prison. She is serving a sentence for a drunk driving accident that left a girl basically paralyzed and severely injured. But suddenly Morgan is approached by two women. It's a woman and her lawyer and they have a proposition for her. They said we need you to restore a mural that's going in the foyer of an art gallery and if you do this for us we will get you out of prison. And naturally Morgan is beyond confused for a few reasons because first of all she doesn't know this woman at all. She has no connection to this woman and she is not an art restorer. Before she ended up in prison she was in art school but she never finished and she certainly had no studies or any background in art restoration so this is completely foreign to her. She has no idea why this particular woman is reaching out to her and after she is released she comes to find that this woman is the daughter of a very well-known and beloved artist. It's actually an artist that Morgan herself really reveres and for some reason after this artist died in his will specifically he said Morgan Christopher has to restore this mural and it has to be restored by this specific date in order for it to go up in the foyer of the art gallery that is being built. And so Morgan is very conflicted over this because like I said she has no background in art restoration whatsoever but she doesn't want to be in prison and so luckily with the help of a man who is helping to like build the art gallery who has a background in restoration he helps her and she starts getting into the swing of restoring the mural and as she's restoring the mural she starts to notice little things in it that shouldn't be there that are a little bit unusual. So this mural was originally supposed to be put up into the post office of a small North Carolina town and it was basically supposed to be a mural depicting the culture of that town but there are some unusual things that she is seeing in this mural kind of like a bloody knife and things like that that she doesn't understand and it causes Morgan to become really invested in the artist Anna Dale and so she starts looking into Anna Dale and her history and she wants to know what happened because Anna Dale mysteriously up and vanished before she officially finished the mural and before it could be hung and then of course the past timeline is Anna Dale and she is moving to the small North Carolina town so she can get a feel for the people in the culture because she has been hired to paint this mural. People in the town aren't really very welcoming of her because there was somebody local that they were expecting to paint this mural but he wasn't selected. So she's getting a lot of hostility from the townspeople but she knows she moves there. She ends up falling in love with the town. She starts painting the mural but she also starts getting some negative attention drawn towards her because she is having high school students help her one of whom is black and this is set in the 1930s so of course that is seen as a big taboo especially when you have a black man and a white woman together. You're finding out what actually happened to her during her time in this town painting the mural and then what eventually happened to her at the end when she suddenly ups and disappears. And I just found the story so completely captivating. I was equally invested in both timelines. I was really loving watching Morgan's experience, learning how to restore the mural and the research that she was doing in Annadale and the people she was able to talk to who recounted their experience of actually knowing Annadale. And then I liked watching Annadale in the past and the struggles that she was encountering trying to paint this mural, the prejudice that was thrown against her in the town, how she was trying to help this young kid who was so talented and who was so in love with art and she just wanted to nurture that talent. And I loved watching how it all came together in the end, all of the answers that you get. I just thought that this was so incredibly well woven. And like I said, just captivating is the best term that I could use to describe this story. It had me absolutely invested in it from start to finish. And this is another one that I just think about quite frequently and I thought it was so magnificently done. And I am very excited to read more from Diane Chamberlain in the future. If you are a historical fiction person and you haven't read Diane Chamberlain, I highly, highly recommend. I also want to talk about The Overnight Guest by Heather Gutenkopf. I actually talked about this book in a recommendations video that I did about my favorite wintry isolation thrillers. This again was another author that I had never really had any experience with before. I had heard of her but I had never read any book by her and so I decided to go ahead and pick this up just because it was a book club selection at the time. It had never before been on my radar and I am so glad that I did because this ended up definitely putting Heather Gutenkopf on my radar and it made me want to read more from her in the future. So this book is actually set over three timelines. In August 2000, a horrific crime has happened that left two dead and two missing and this perspective is told from a 12 year old girl who was one of the victims of this crime and also a bunch of the other players that are trying to like solve the crime and things of that nature. In the present day timeline you are following Wiley who is a true crime writer and she has actually taken up temporary residence in this house where that terrible crime occurred two decades prior and she's doing this because the next true crime novel that she's writing is actually following the crime that happened and so she wants to be in the place where it happened but also she desperately needs time away from her angsty teenage son as well as her ex-husband. There's some drama going on there. She's finding herself increasingly frustrated by her teenage son and she just she needs some time away. So she is there hoping that she can make some progress on this novel that she is writing. But one day a terrible snowstorm blows in and she ends up discovering a young child on the grounds of this property basically almost frozen to death. And so she takes a child into this house but doing so actually causes a lot of complications for Wiley that she wasn't expecting. And so from her perspective you're finding out who this child is and what ends up happening afterwards where this child came from. 
came from. Then there's a third perspective. You don't know really who this perspective is from. You just know it's from a young child. And from contextual information, you come to find out what her situation is. She is with her mother and she is in less than great circumstances. And I'm not going to say more than that, but just through contextual information, you can kind of figure out what she and her mother are currently experiencing. So I found that this was an expertly plotted narrative because you're following these three separate timelines, three separate perspectives, and how they are all woven together. And I very much enjoyed the way that Heather Gutenkopf was able to do that. It was very much like a puzzle with pieces being given to you bit by bit. So she does a really great job of providing you with enough contextual information where you as the reader can kind of start connecting the different timelines and start putting things together. And so you're putting together that puzzle, but she's still leaving a few pieces out so that there's that kind of shock factor near the end. And like I said, I just thought that this was another one that was so well woven. I love when these multiple timelines come together in unexpected ways. And it definitely did that for me. And so I definitely think that she has the potential to be a very strong suspense thriller author for me. And I'm absolutely excited to check out more from her. I do plan on reading another one of her books in 2023. And so we're going to see how that one goes. But this was an absolutely strong start to Heather Gutenkopf for me. And another one that I very much recommend, especially if you were looking for a strong thriller or more specifically a strong isolationist thriller. Speaking of very strong wintry isolation thrillers, one that's going to come to no surprise to anyone, A Solitude of Wolverines by Alice Henderson. I have talked about this multiple times in multiple different videos on my channel and it absolutely had to end up here because I still think about this book. So this is following our main character, Dr. Alex Carter. She is a naturalist, a wildlife biologist. And at the time of the start of the story, she's been living in Boston for the past few years. She moved out there to be with her boyfriend at the time, but that relationship has since failed. And she's no longer happy being in Boston. She wants to be back out in the field. That's where she feels like she belongs. And so when she's presented with the opportunity to move into Northern Montana mountains to study wolverines, she jumps at the chance. She wants to leave Boston. And so she goes and she's expected to be out there over one full winter period studying the wolverines. She's going to be staying in kind of an odd location. It is an abandoned kind of ski resort area that a nature preserve purchased. So the land on there is nature preserve and it is protected, but nothing has really happened with the lodge. So it's kind of an abandoned lodge that's been kind of made habitable. So she is going to be staying there. But once she gets to the town, she kind of notices hostilities are being thrown her way. People in the town are not necessarily happy to have her there because they had some different ideas for what they wanted to happen with the land. And they are not happy that she is there to save and protect the land and protect the wolverines. She's not really bothered by it. She's going to stay and do what she needs to do. But then she starts noticing sinister things happening on the nature preserve land itself. And then when some of that stuff comes after her, it suddenly becomes a game of survival and the stakes end up getting a lot higher because eventually it's not just about her. There are other lives at stake in this as well. I just loved this one immensely. I loved, of course, the wintry isolation vibes, but really the last two hours of the story while I was listening to it on audiobook, just so intense. Like I was on the edge of my seat. I just wanted to keep turning the pages. I was so mad when I had to stop listening and go into work because I just wanted to know what happened because like I said, the stakes got very, very high. So this is one that I think really delivered on what you would expect from this novel. She is on her own. People are coming after her. People want her dead and it is a fight for survival. And like I said, there are other lives at stake that she has to try to protect as well. And so that's why I thought this was so strong. I would say that this is second only to No Exit in terms of like my favorite wintry isolation thriller at this point. This was so strong and I'm very much excited to continue in this series. There are now two other books out in this series and I hope that they are just as strong. And then another one that is going to come as absolutely no surprise to anybody, Markably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. So this follows our main character, Tova Sullivan, and she is an older woman. She, I believe, is in like her late 60s, early 70s at the start of the story. And she is very much on her own at this point, and she's experienced her fair share of grief. 30 years prior to the start of this novel, when her son was just 18, he was out on a boat in the Puget Sound and he mysteriously disappeared. And the police all seemed to think it was suicide that he just kind of jumped off the boat and killed himself, but Tova doesn't believe that. But she was never able to prove it, and she was never able to figure out what happened to her son. So over the past three decades, it's just been her and her husband, and then he has recently passed away from cancer. So like I said, she is very much on her own. And in order to kind of pass the time, she ends up doing janitorial services at the local aquarium overnight. And it is during her overnight shifts that she starts to develop an interesting relationship with Marcellus, who is a giant Pacific octopus. And you're following them as they are developing this relationship because Marcellus, as are all octopuses, octopi, they are, as the title suggests, remarkably bright creatures. And so you're following their developing relationship. And you also do get Marcellus's perspective in here, which was fantastic. He is now definitely one of my new favorite literary animal characters of all time. The audiobook narrator did such a great job with him. The voice was practically perfect. I loved it a lot. There's also another main character perspective in here, and I don't really want to say anything about him. And the reason is, is because his perspective is not even like mentioned on the dust jacket here. So if you were just to pick up this book and read the dust jacket, you would think this book was almost entirely about Tova and her relationship with Marcellus, but it's not. There is 
the second main character in here and it really is about the journey about learning who this guy is and how he ends up connecting with Tova. I just thought that this book was so heartwarming and so touching. It's kind of exactly what you would expect going into this story and that's why it made this list. It didn't make my all-time favorites of 2022 simply because I didn't get what I was necessarily wanting from it. I was really hoping that this was primarily Tova and Marcellus's relationship but that was almost a side plot. Marcellus was definitely more of a side character and that's not what I was expecting going in. This was very much advertised as relationship between Marcellus and Tova. So I didn't necessarily emotionally connect to it as much as I wanted to which is why it didn't get like the 4.5 or the 4 but still the overall story was just so amazingly touching and I love the way that it all came together in the end. I liked what Shelby Van Pelt did with it and of course Marcellus has my whole heart. So I totally believe that this book deserves all the hype that it is getting. It will have pride of place on my bookshelves. I will keep this book forever and I will absolutely be looking out for more of Shelby Van Pelt's books in the future. All right y'all that is it. Those are the honorable mentions from 2022. Books that were so strong of a reading experience that I still think about them and I wanted to share them here with you so you could check them out if you have not already. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these and what your experience with them was. I would love to know. I would also love to know if you have any honorable mentions from 2022. So books that didn't quite make your best of list but that still kind of take up space in your mind quite frequently. And as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. I post videos two times a week sometimes three if I have my shit together and have something to film and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.